Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our uh, Fairbanks Ethics Lecture, uh, which is a series we offer monthly through the academic year. We've been doing this for approximately 14 years altogether. Uh, my name is Paul Helft. I'm the director of the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. Just a few housekeeping items. Uh, please make sure that you've signed in at the outside uh, table, just outside the doors. Um, no food and drink in the Riley Auditorium. Uh, thank you for joining this series. We're going to be taking our, our usual summer break and starting our lectures again on September 5th, and we'll blast you with emails with the upcoming selection of lectures for next year. Um, this is being recorded and broadcast today, and I want to thank everybody who's joining us remotely from IU Health Ball Memorial, from West, North, Blackford, and Arnett, as well as Reed Health today. Um, please silence all your electronic devices, and if you need to return calls, there are house phones out in the foyer. Um, there are no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose for the speakers. So, Annie Mons, our co terrific coordinator, writes, turn over on the page. So it's a really great pleasure to introduce to you two of my favorite people um, anywhere, but certainly here at IU. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a really abbreviated introduction because um, I, I want to frame a few questions for you, and I want you to know mostly about Dr. Schneider and Dr. Radovich, that if you, you know, you'll meet many, many smart people around this campus, but you will never meet two smarter people than you're going to hear from uh, today, and also two more wonderful people than you're going to hear from today. So Dr. Schneider is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Medical and Molecular Genetics at IU Melvin and Simon, uh, Melvin and Bren Simon Cancer Center. Um, he is an expert in uh, breast oncology, um, and did a uh, pharmacokinetics fellowship when he was a fellow. I remember him as a fellow when I was a junior faculty member here. And then he founded uh, and became the first director of the Indiana University Health Precision Genomics Program. He has an extremely long and productive resume, as they both do, and I could you know, spend the next 10 minutes talking about it, but I would absolutely encourage you to uh, look them up and come up and ask questions at the end if they have some time. Milan Radovich is an assistant professor in the Department of Surgery and is a member of the IU Simon Cancer Center and the IU Center for Computational Biology and Bioinformatics and is uh, vi vice president for oncology genomics at Indiana University Health. He runs uh, and has an extremely productive um, uh, uh, laboratory um, where he hosts graduate students um, and has a very productive career in this area. And his, uh, although he came out of laboratory medicine, has turned himself into a clinician at the same time, one of the very few laboratory uh, um, doctoral level investigators who spends time with patients. So anyway, um, uh, many more things that we could say about them. I wanted to frame, so this, we've asked them to come and talk about um, what I think is a, a generationally important area um, in, in our field of oncology, but in medicine in general, and that is uh, access to genomic sequencing, the ability at uh, a relatively small cost to sequence uh, the human genome uh, has really is in the process of transforming medicine and oncology in particular, and you're all um, bearing witness to that right now. Certainly this is the most exciting thing or among the very most exciting things that's happened in a generation in our field. And I just want to raise a few questions so as you're hearing about the program, if you could think through these questions. There are so many questions ethically and clinically ethically that uh, are raised by this area of medicine, and I just want to frame a few of them so that you can think about these in context. So there are all kinds of technical issues which we could spend an entire talk about. You know, the quality of the data acquired and how it varies, the interpretation of data, um, and whether the people interpreting it are actually uh, experienced enough to be able to interpret. Um, these two have assembled an entire group of people that interpret the data because we have felt that that was an important aspect of interpreting what turns out to be extraordinarily voluminous and complex uh, data. Less than 30 percent of patients who have next generation sequencing go on to receive genomically guided therapy. So what's the real cost-benefit ratio here if only one out of three patients that we're sequencing for, what's the commercial cost, $3,000 or $3,500 these days? How much are we really getting uh, at a population level? How do we manage um, the uh, unexpected or expected germline findings? We identify uh, a disease or a disease category, a disease susceptibility in a patient, and what do we do with that information? What if that disease has nothing to do with the disease that we're expert in? We're testing them for cancer, and we find out that they have neurological disease. Um, so many questions related to that. How do we manage the increased uncertainty that arises? We're in a very new area at the edge of the water in clinical medicine. 
um, surrounding calculating risk-benefit ratios. We, as clinicians, operate on risk-benefit ratios. We try to calculate whether we're you know, more likely to harm or to help a patient. And now we're in an area of vast uncertainty, and we can't calculate that anymore. So, uh, and then should uh, the occasional dramatic responders, which you will read about you know, in the New York Times and Time Magazine and others in cancer, cause us to reconsider how we treat patients, especially towards the end of life? So should we take desperate patients who are you know, close to death within two months or three months of death and offer them these therapies uh, when we wouldn't ordinarily necessarily recommend that they do that? So think about those questions um, as uh, Milan and Brian go uh, through the description of their program and what they do. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting Dr. Schneider and I to speak to you today. And uh, I think Dr. Hell failed to mention that both he and I are Chicagoans, um, which is a really important thing for you to know. Uh, I was a North Sider, though. He was a South Sider. So there's a little bit of a trust issue there. But <laughs> otherwise, we... we <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, but we're really excited to have this opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we're doing uh, with precision medicine through our clinical program, the IU Health Precision Genomics program. So, I'm going to start off with giving you a little introduction behind the science and how it works, and then Dr. Schneider is going to come up and lead our discussion on the ethical uh, issues and uh, questions that we have when doing genomics for patient care. So, I always love starting off with this slide: uh, the new era in personalized medicine, personalizing medicine with genomics, and. Um, is a really exciting time in precision medicine. The idea of using cutting, advan cutting edge advanced technologies to really tailor therapy for, based on the individual makeup of each uh, patient. And uh, we've been getting a lot of press lately, as you can imagine. And I'll never forget uh, about now three years ago, two and a half years ago, sitting on my recliner in my house, uh, watching the State of the Union on my laptop, and all of a sudden the President of the United States mentions precision medicine. And I was shocked that a politician knew what that meant. <laughs> but long story short, I was just excited. And I, and I knew at that moment, probably my job's secure for a while. Um, but, but it was very cool uh, you know, to, to see uh, this just massive investment by the government into this concept of precision medicine. And subsequently, the next day at a press conference at the White House, which is pictured here, uh, the White House launched a $270 million initiative uh, known as the Precision Medicine Initiative. Subsequent to that, um, as many of you know, Vice President Joe Biden, his son had unfortunately succumbed to brain cancer, and he made his personal mission to reinvigorate the, uh, war, uh, the uh, Richard Nixon's war on cancer, and had launched the cancer moonshot. And as part of that cancer moonshot, there's been a lot of initiatives uh, into precision medicine. But the number one reason I showed this slide is not to talk about the hype that we see today, but actually to point a, to an important fact that IU has been leaders in precision medicine long before the White House ever made their announcement. Actually, since 2001, when the late Dr. David Flockhart was first recruited here, we've been working in precision medicine. So what you're seeing today, what we've done with our program, is really the fruition of many, many years of research in the laboratories at the IU School of Medicine that has brought, brought us uh, to where we are today. So why do we need precision medicine in cancer? Well, the reality is cancer is not one disease. Um, and it's not even the 212 diseases that are classified by organ type that the NCI uh, designates them. For example, colon cancer, breast cancer, and so on. What's, interestingly is that, what's interesting is if you take two patients with the same diagnosis, same histology, same age, same race, grew up in the same neighborhood, drank the same things, and whatnot, if each of them were to develop the same type of cancer, as I mentioned, and you were to look at their molecular fingerprint, each one would have its own unique molecular fingerprint. I personally have analyzed thousands of cancer genomes. I've never seen two that are alike. Every person's genome is very, very unique. And the problem in cancer medicine is that we've really operated under antiquated dogma that says we're going to take a group of patients with the same diagnosis, treat them with the same drug, and expect the same response. And the reality is that does not happen. Some patients do well with a particular drug, some do not. So how do we use the best and cutting edge technologies to really tailor therapy for an individual patient and really treat these cancers with, based on the reality that they're really N of 1 diseases? Now, when we talk about precision medicine, um, and if you read about it in the New York Times or in Time Magazine and whatnot, you're going to see one thing, which is that cancer really leads the way. And now, I'm not saying that because I'm biased against psychology or cardiology or anything like that. I, I love all those fields, too. Um, but you will see the most advances in oncology and because cancer, at its essence, is a disease of DNA. Um, cancer is caused when there are certain typos in the gen genetic code of normal cells that essentially cause it to go haywire and become malignant. These mutations uh, come from a few different sources. Um, one that we know that uh, is present in about 10 to 15% of cancers is hereditary mutations. So I'll, 
I know we have a lot of genetic counselors in this room, but patients who harbor genes like BRCA1 or BRCA2 are going to be at a much higher risk of developing breast and ovarian and, uh, for men, prostate cancer. Another thing that's really bad is walking through a nuclear reactor. That's going to get you some cancer. <laughs> you really don't want to do that. Or drinking benzene. Really don't want to do that. <laughs> but radiation or chemicals, uh, honestly, the one thing we think about is, uh, that's actually a more popular example, is uh, Hiroshima survivors, those who develop leukemias later on in life because of exposure to radiation. And then we have this very surprising source, and actually uh, from data from Johns Hopkins, is probably the cause of 66% of all cancers, which is spontaneous errors during DNA duplication. What does that complex term mean? Well, whether you know it or not, you started off as a single cell at one point, after mom and dad. Um, anyway, uh, so you started off as a single cell, and eventually you grew into an organism. And every time, and to grow into this person you are today, which today I'm 30 pounds lighter than I was a year ago. But anyway, uh, to grow into what you are today, uh, your cells had to go under, uh, undergo trillions of cell divisions. And every time the cell divides, uh, the machinery is extremely good at, at replicating that DNA, almost perfectly, but it's not, not exactly perfect. Interestingly, every time a cell divides, about seven mutations are incorporated into the genome. Well, unfortunately what happens due to some random chance is enough of these mutations occur in the right genes that really cause that, can that normal cell to go haywire and become cancerous. And so what we've been able to learn through a lot of elegant studies is that a lot of these mutations that eventually form a full-blown tumor were due to these random mutations that occur during DNA replication. So again, uh, really the premise of precision medicine is finding the right drug for the right person at the right time. And uh, really our goal is to take these groups of patients who have a particular diagnosis, use the best and cutting edge technology, and really try to find those patients who are gonna receive the most benefit uh, and the least toxicity. Now I've got an interesting story with this figure. I mentioned to genetic counselors when I spoke to them a few weeks ago. Um, Brian and I have been using this figure for how many years? 10? Many, many, many years. We've used this in almost every talk. And so two years ago, um, I flew into DC to go to the AACR meeting. I'm waiting at the conveyor belt to pick up my luggage. And I strike up with a conversation with the guy next to me from Eli Lilly. And I go, what's your name? He goes, I'm Chuck Walgren. I'm like, are you the Walgren from JCO 2005? He's like, yep, that's me. <laughs> Total random chance. I was like, I use, your, I use your figure every talk I give. So anyway. Did you get an autograph? I should have, I should have. So what do we want to get? Well, we want to get responses like these, and this is a very uh, well-known published example of a patient who really benefited uh, from the early days of precision medicine. So this is a patient uh, that you can see with disseminated metastatic melanoma. As you can see, unfortunately, a huge amount of metastases. And at that time, uh, was being seen at Dana-Farber and was one of the early patients to receive genomic sequencing. And when they sequenced the genome, he was found to have what we commonly now know is the BRAF B600E mutation. So this is a mutation that occurs in melanoma cells that causes them to be essentially supercharged, is the way to think about it. They grow rapidly, become aggressive. And uh, when they found that mutation, he was very lucky to enroll on a very early phase trial of a drug at that time called PLX5022, made by a small company called Plexicon. Well, that company ended up being bought by Merck. The drug now is known as bemurafenib. But long story short, you can see after a course of bemurafenib had a dramatic response. These are the things that we want to see. Um, I will, though, come back to this patient later in my talk because, um, unfortunately, while we see a really great response here, there is the unfortunate nature of metastatic disease, but I'll come back to you uh, later. Now, if you go anywhere in the country to any cancer meeting, you go to a precision medicine talk, it is now a rule that you have to show your favorite patient. And so this is uh, our particular favorite patient. And this is a very pleasant gentleman from Fort Wayne um, who was being seen by some uh, fine oncologists at Fort Wayne Medical Oncology. Um, and he was diagnosed with metastatic anaplastic thyroid cancer. Uh, and if you guys are not familiar with this disease, it's extremely aggressive, uh, typical overall survival of three to four months. And when he came to see us, had already progressed through two lines of chemotherapy. So it was really uh, not doing quite well. And his oncologist uh, decided to send it to us to see if we could potentially find something that would be beneficial. Well, we ended up sequencing his, uh, his uh, genome and ended up finding out that he had the BRAF B600E mutation, um, not with melanoma, but this time with thyroid cancer. And that his tumor also overproduced a protein called PDL1. And uh, the way to think about PDL1 is it's like a camouflage that tumor cells put on their surface to tell the patient's immune system to go away. 
Uh, interestingly, our immune systems are actually primed to attack cancers, so cancers actually develop abilities to evade the immune system. So long story short, uh, we sent our recommendations back to our oncologist. We said, okay, try vemurafenib first. If vemurafenib doesn't work, go to an uh, uh, anti pdl one therapy. And against our best recommendations, the, patient ended, uh, the doctor ended up putting him on both drugs, mixed two drugs that I don't think to that point have ever been mixed before. But long story short, put him on, we can talk about the ethical implications of that <laughs> a little bit later. But I ended up putting him on both drugs and actually had a dramatic response, complete response greater than two years. Here's a picture of the lung met, as you can see here, has been greatly diminished, or actually was completely gone on this scan. Actually had a complete response for greater than two years um, and only very recently uh, just developed a recurrence in the arm. I haven't, have we heard anything since then? We have not heard, but long story short, had a really great response. So another thing that's important uh, when we think about genomics and cancer therapy is that we also need to think about the side effects. Um, obviously, a lot of times when we're dealing with a deadly disease, we're very fixated on how are we going to attack the cancer. But unfortunately, that really uh, noble prospect of attacking the cancer, many times what we forget about is the toxicities that one can experience when on these therapies. Things like ovarian suppression, vomiting, neuropathies, congestive heart failure, hypertension, and neutropenia. And many of these can be very debilitating side effects. What's been very interesting is that some of the uh, genomic germline variability that we're born with actually can influence what toxicities, i.e. what side effects that we experience to certain drugs. Many of these genes are genes that are expressed in our livers uh, whose job is to metabolize drugs. And each of us have a little bit of different variation in those particular genes, such that a, a particular patient treated with one drug may get no side effect, but you take another patient treated with the same drug and dose and develop a horrible side effect. What's really interesting is through really great research done in Dr. Schneider's laboratory, done at uh, Dr. Scar, Dr. Flocker, and many of our folks uh, in the Division of Clinical Pharmacology have really begun to develop really cool predictive markers of toxicity. Really with the premise, can we begin to, ahead of time, identify patients who may develop these really horrible side effects and be able to mitigate those? And so as part of our program, we do a full pharmacogenomic analysis of our patients. We want to take care of both. Can we attack the tumor? And at the same time, can we try to prevent uh, side effects to degree as much as possible? So um, Brian and I, in about late 2012, early 2013, we're having some coffee in the hallway in Walter Hall. You know, we were bored, had nothing else to do, um, and decided, you know, we saw this convergence of genomics, bioinformatics, drug development, um, a lot of cool science, and we came up, uh, very haphazardly, but we came up with this great idea of this Indiana University Health Precision Genomic Program, and we call this a clinical program with an academic base. Um, our program uh, is uh, primarily sees patients uh, whose tumors are refractory to standard options or rare tumors where there are no FDA-approved standard of care options. So our typical patients are patients with stage four metastatic solid tumors. As part of our clinic, uh, these patients uh, get cutting edge next generation sequencing. And what, and, I, and what I really mean cutting edge, um, I, I like to tell people that you can hear about precision medicine on the radio and NPR all the time. You know, there's a tons of groups out there offering precision medicine. Uh, and the way I explain this is that, you know, just like in everything in life, you've got the Walmart of precision medicine, and you've got the Brooks Brothers of precision medicine, okay? And let me tell you, the shirts of Brooks Brothers are a lot better. Uh, anyway, um, so there's going to be varying degrees in quality. And I, what I'm really proud to say is I think we really offer um, what, I, what is truly the best and cutting edge technology available. Uh, this is whole genome DNA sequencing. So all 3.2 billion letters of the genome, both tumor and normal, are sequenced for these patients whole transcriptome sequencing. So we look at all the RNA, so the message from the DNA. And then we do a protein analysis. We look at the machine, uh, the machines that are produced um, in the cells. So we look at the blueprint, we look at the message, and we look at the machine. And then we take all that data and then link them to drugs uh, that may be uh, potentially beneficial for the patients. We also, as I mentioned, we do a full-blown uh, full uh, host or germline genomic analysis, both looking for uh, variation that may predispose them, uh, germline variation that predisposes patients to cancer or other potential diseases, as well as the pharmacogenomics. We then take all that data and really uh, uh, focus on making a therapy selection. I'll talk a little bit more about how we do this in tumor board, but we take this data and we cross-reference uh, evidence of particular drugs um, and their association with those genetic markers. We're always also going to assess patients' prior therapies, comorbidities, and overlapping toxicities when we're making our decisions. We also uh, use the data to really drive clinical uh, research. Um, as you can imagine, many of the drugs that are being developed today by major pharma 
uh, is really geared towards finding uh, drugs that are going to be sensitive to particular genomic alterations. And so this has been a really fantastic opportunity to really court pharma to say, we've got patients with particular alterations. You're developing a drug that may match. Please bring your trial here. And then lastly, we biobank all these specimens uh, in the clinical data for translational journal research. I'll show you a slide in just a little bit of how we're trying to make this data uh, really available to uh, all our investigators. Uh, so when we see patients in clinic, so there, there's the actual how long does it take to sequence, but then there's also the clinical thing, which is biopsy, interpretation, drug. So we always tell patients six to eight weeks when they see us from uh, in clinic. The actual time of DNA extraction and sequencing is somewhere roughly around three weeks-ish for whole genome. So this is uh, the, uh, a simple schematic of how our clinic works. Patients, uh, we have the privilege of seeing patients for two visits. Uh, on their first visit, they're going to get an uh, introduction to genomics. They're going to get uh, history and physical uh, by Dr. Schneider. And then we're going to uh, deem, uh, we're going to determine what tissue is going to be appropriate for sequencing. If patients have uh, tissue available in pathology, we obviously uh, may use that. In many cases, we, may, uh, we will need to get a new biopsy. Our nursing staff has done a phenomenal job to uh, set up biopsies such that most patients get their biopsies the same day. So they come to see us in clinic and then go down to radiology for their biopsy. We then send the sample off for sequencing, and then those results come back, are reviewed by our team internally first, and then go to our tumor board. At the tumor board, we're going to make a decision on a therapeutic plan. And this is basically the three potential outcomes. The first one is the affirmation of an FDA-approved, or what we're calling a standard drug. Um, this is probably our least common output, as many of the patients who come to see us have already seen many of the FDA-approved therapies or all the FDA-approved therapies for their cancer, so this is going to be our least common uh, possibility. The second one is the selection of a non-standard or what we call an off-label FDA-approved drug, meaning there's a drug available that targets that particular genomic aberration, but it's not approved for that type of cancer. It's approved in a different type of cancer, and Dr. Schneider is going to speak a little bit more to off-label drugs a little bit later, or recommendation to early phase clinical trials. <laughs> Um, I'm really happy to say that we've been able to uh, divide ourselves too and clone uh, and really expand this uh, more uh, throughout the state. Uh, what we currently operate is actually uh, uh, four uh, clinics across the state. We have our central core uh, in Indianapolis um, and then expansion sites at uh, Muncie Ball Memorial, Lafayette Arnett, and at Bloomington. And it's been a fantastic partnership. Um, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of these sites of community are not going to have the genomic expertise and the drug development knowledge to really run the program, but they do a phenomenal job seeing patients. And so we've been able to uh, create, a, I think, a highly synergistic uh, hub and spoke model where at the community sites, they take care of seeing patients, educate, educating them, doing the biopsies, treatment, and so on. But all the genomic analysis, all the databasing, all the follow-up, all the um, all the clinical trials matching and our tumor board is done centrally. So they call in on a weekly basis to our tumor board um, and uh, where we discuss their patients. But the main reason I show this slide is, and probably something more uh, applicable to this audience, is the idea of access. Um, I think what's been wonderful through this statewide program is that patients have phenomenal access to genomic care. And I always like to say that patient, a farmer in rural Indiana has more access to whole genome sequencing than most people live in Boston and New York and San Francisco. And something we're very, very proud of. Most patients uh, can be seen the same week or the week after um, once we're referred and be able to get them genomic sequencing. So uh, since we opened, uh, we first started our program with two, uh, me, Brian, a patient, uh, one nurse and a part-time pharmacist, and it's grown substantially, as you can see. Uh, we've seen about 1,800 patients since, actually, we, we are on the verge of our 2,000th patient any, any day now, actually, uh, since April 18th of 2014. 71% uh, of our patients, uh, the genomic results provide an actionable target. Uh, this is a real testament to the comprehensiveness of sequencing that we do. 69% uh, of patients have a recommendation to a clinical trial as part of their plan. And then we have uh, also re uh, published about well, a couple years ago a formal efficacy analysis on our first 100 available patients. As I mentioned, uh, all patients are reviewed by this multidisciplinary tumor board. And uh, I think Brian and I share the same sentiment. This is my favorite part of our program, this weekly meeting on Thursday mornings where I think Right now, it's 30 to 40 of, I think, some of the smartest people in the state of Indiana and, frankly, the nation get together, and we, we go over every single patient. We go over their prior history, their prior treatments. We go over the genomic results, and we come up with a plan. And what I love about this board is just the diversity of expertise. You know, folks from clinical oncology, scientists, ethicists, pathologists, 
pharmacists, um, every single genetic counselors, everyone providing um, their own input into a particular patient. And I, I tell you something, you know, when I um, do my little intro talk with patients, they come on their first visit, and I tell them, you know what, you're going to have 20, or 30, 20 to 30 brains just focused on you, how much solace they take in that, that they're getting the best people here at the university really focused on their care, and it's been a really fun part of our program. Um, one thing that's relatively new um, is through uh, funding from the uh, IU Health Precision Health Initiative, uh, we are now working on developing a new bioinformatic platform for precision uh, uh, health data. And this is being called, it was originally called the Data Commons, we're now calling the Precision Health Cloud. But soon we'll have a new home for all this genomic data that we are producing on these patients matched with all their clinical data in a single repository to really ask fantastic research questions. And so from these sorts of uh, initiatives, really the goal is to identify new potential drug targets, new biology, new markers of uh, predicting toxicities and efficacy. Uh, but from this, uh, we will have a patient viewer, we'll have a cohort builder, we'll have the ability to do uh, graphical-based analytics, clinical trials matching, uh, actually have a PRO tool for patient engagement, uh, and people have this in a single place where investigators will have access to the data. So very excited about this. The prototype is actually live, um, but a full-blown version will probably be ready sometime later this year. In our program, um, we see a wide variety of cancer diagnoses. Um, our most common, uh, actually, thank you, Dr. Health, colorectal, <laughs> breast, sarcoma, and pancreatic, and a long tail of other types of cancers. But some of the most fun um, uh, in terms of tumor biology, most fun things we see are this little, really large peak of other. Um, and I suffice it to say, this large peak of other has really been driven by Dr. Larry Einhorn, who sees some of the most craziest cancers that I think one could see. I am not ashamed to admit that we've seen some cancer so rare, we pull up Wikipedia in clinic because we've never heard of it. <laughs> I mean, it's a couple of things that are pretty rare. Um, what's also neat, though, is I know for a fact that we, have, we probably have whole genome sequencing on some of these rare cancers that have never been sequenced before, so we need to get to publishing those. Uh, but long story short, a variety, a variety of diagnoses. So, you know, it's really cool um, that one can do really cutting-edge science, really cutting-edge bioinformatics, have phenomenal brains look at every single patient. But then the question is, does it matter? Does it matter clinically? Are we actually providing a benefit to patients? And so a couple years ago, uh, we published our first paper on our first 100 available patients, uh, where we looked at a survival outcome known as the progression-free survival ratio. I won't go into a ton of detail on it, but long story short, how this particular um, uh, statistic works is that when patients with metastatic cancer are being treated, um, they, many of them will receive a variety of drugs for their treatment, but will be given sequentially. And the unfortunate reality is that every next drug that they try, usually the time that they're on that drug gets shorter and shorter and shorter because the cancer progresses quicker, quicker, and quicker. And so what we did in this particular analysis is we took the time that they were on the genomic therapy and actually divided it by the time they were on their prior therapy. And we said if the genomic therapy beat the prior therapy by at least 30%, we consider that a positive outcome. And this was a model that's been statistically vetted uh, prior to us doing it. And what you can see in this particular analysis, 43.2% of patients who have genomic therapy receive the benefit of PFS ratio greater than 1.3 versus only 5.3% in the non-genomic arm. So um, our pharmacist, uh, Patrick Keel, was the one who originally did this analysis. And like Dr. Health, he's a Chicago Southsider. And I didn't trust him. I'm like, dude, you cook the books. <laughs> These results look a little bit too good for me. Uh, and I went through the data and it was actually real. But what really brought home the reality of these results is we then presented this at ASCO um, that year. Um, and at the same meeting, actually in the same session, um, University of California, San Diego, and University of Michigan uh, were also presenting their results. And they had strikingly similar, similar results in their PFS ratios. It made us feel that we validated these clinical outcome results with their results. So we feel very good about this particular data. So let's go back to this case. Um, patient, early uh, adopter of genomic sequencing, had the BRAF V600E mutation, had a dramatic response. But as I mentioned, there's an unfortunate nature to metastatic disease. Eventually, the cancer outsmarts the therapy. It does come back. And many times when it does come back, it comes back with a vengeance. 
what's interesting uh, uh, at the biological level is that these tumors literally evolve in real time. So very similar to weed resistance or antibiotic resistance, these cancers will develop new mutations to overcome their initial therapy and to come back. So I use this as a lead-in to address a question that's probably the number one question we get from patients, which is, why do we wait till they're metastatic before we do genome sequencing? Why aren't we doing genome sequencing earlier in their disease course? And probably a really good ethical question to discuss. And the, nature, and the reason uh, being is, in many cases, the drugs that are used in early stage cancers, what we call the curative setting, have been proven in multiple phase three trials and have been approved by the FDA to be effective. And so one, if one was to go in there, do genome sequencing, and give a drug that doesn't have as much evidence, that's really doing cowboy medicine. You're, I, you're at the risk of uh, potentially harming a patient if their cancer, especially if their cancer relapses. But are there certain situations where genomics can be potentially introduced in certain curative settings where it may be really beneficial to the patient and not actually take away their standard care therapy? And I'm going to use that to introduce our clinical trial, BRE-12158, a randomized controlled trial of genomically directed therapy in triple negative breast cancer. This is PI'd by Dr. Schneider. And this is a really cool trial because it takes triple negative breast cancers. So uh, for those who are not familiar, triple negative breast cancer is a much more aggressive form of breast cancer. It makes about 15% of breast cancers. And uh, unfortunately, has not really benefited from many of the advances we've seen in other types of breast cancer, such as estrogen receptor and HER2 positive disease. But anyway, these patients, triple negative breast cancers, they get neoadjuvant chemotherapy, meaning they get chemotherapy prior to surgery. And what's interesting is at the time of surgery, there's really two dichotomous outcomes. The first outcome is the uh, surgeon goes in there, resects the area where the tumor was, the pathologist looks under the scope, and there's no tumor left meaning the chemotherapy <laughs> obliterated all the cancer. And we call that a pathologic complete response. Uh, interestingly, those patients end up doing really quite well um, after surgery. But the other two thirds of patients, they'll go to surgery, they'll get their tumor resected, the pathologist will look under the microscope and there's still a viable tumor left. We call that residual disease. Those patients unfortunately do very poorly. Uh, at least half of them will relapse within the first three years after surgery and we know their outcomes are quite poor. What's interesting is there's no FDA-approved standard of care for patients with residual disease after surgery. Actually, until some more recent data, uh, the standard of care was to wait and see for this cancer to come back. So what this trial does is it takes these patients who are at really high risk of their cancer coming back, so patients with significant residual disease, performs sequencing of that residual disease tumor, and then randomizes them to a genomically directed therapeutic versus physician choice. And what's really cool about this trial here is all the patients are getting their standard of care, and now we're adding genomic therapy to patients who are really high risk. So we're not taking away what the FDA said is effective. Um, and now we're adding what may be a potential hope for these patients for the cancer not to come back. Our primary endpoint here is not progression-free survival, but actually disease-free survival. What we're trying to do is actually increase the cure rate in these particular, uh, in this patient population. Trials open at 26 sites. We have 160 of her 85 patients enrolled. We plan to finish enrollment uh, late summer, early fall of this year. So with that, uh, that was the intro to all the fantastic science. Now I'm going to leave you off to someone better looking and smarter than me, Dr. Schneider. <laughs> so Milan got a, uh, thank you. So, um, so Milan got to talk about the, the fun stuff here. And it's, uh, it's rare that I get an opportunity to talk to an audience where the majority know way more about the topic than me, which is ethics. So what I thought we would do is you guys can help me out here. Dr. Help did a great job, I think, praising some of the unique things that we deal with with this sort of approach. But I'll give you a little bit of background in terms of what we have considered ethical dilemmas, give you a little bit of the data to support it or refute it. And then would love to essentially learn from you guys so we can do a, a better job of being ethical. Um, one of the top ones, of course, is we routinely consider off-label use of FDA-approved drugs. So we find a hit that maybe would be really appropriate for a prostate cancer, but the patient's a breast cancer patient. So is it ethical to use that uh, uh, in front of maybe a third-line prostate cancer drug? I think that's one our tumor board addresses a lot. And, Maybe we do a great job of it because we have the right people in the room. Maybe we don't. But this happens also in the community where maybe a single doctor is making a decision for everyone. So I think one that we can talk about. Implications of germline findings, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about. Um, 
the cost of testing, Dr. Health brought up, and when is the right time to test. So this has become an interesting topic, which is incidentally finding a predisposition for cancer when you didn't expect it. So Dr. Radovich went through the really cool science. We look at 22,000 genes and variants. And what we're doing as oncologists is we're looking for drug targets. Okay? We're looking for a typographical error that says this drug's going to work. Sometimes, though, we happen to come across something that looks like they might have inherited from mom or dad. And that's a big problem because now, instead of focusing only on this is the drug we're going to give you, we're now rerouting to what about the patient's risk for other cancers? Maybe more importantly, what about their children, their brothers and sisters? So we kind of open a whole can of worms. The question was, we were seeing this in clinic, the question is, how common is this? And the answer is much more common than we thought. So these are a variety of series that have been published in the last couple of years. And you see that number is somewhere between 5 and 15% of the time. And in fact, uh, the biggest one that was just published this month from the TCGA says about 8%. So that's probably going to be about the number we're looking at. And by the way, the current guidelines for testing for hereditary cancer is about 10%. So by de facto uh, numbers here, it would suggest that maybe all cancer patients should have hereditary germline testing. Now, why is this a problem? Uh, for the genetic counselors in the room, please forgive my blunt approach to this, but you know, when we think about doing germline testing, we often do family history. If you have a pedigree that suggests, wow, there were you know, a couple of, I, I do the thing if I'm like, wow, you have six sisters that had breast cancer, okay, we're gonna do testing. But there's very formal guidelines in terms of who should be tested. Once we see someone who's high risk, a good genetic counselor will then tell them before the test is done, these are the genes we want to look at. We'll try to limit the number of questionable variants so that we have a less likelihood of a false positive finding. And if we find it, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do about it, okay? Unfortunately, when you do big sequencing, we're just looking at everything. Sometimes it matches with the tumor type, et cetera. So the question I had is, if we do big sequencing in this 8%, could we have predicted it better? In other words, were we just doing a bad job of doing a family history? And, and maybe if you looked at this data carefully, all of these patients would have had the appropriate guidance. These were data that were published in JAMA this year from the impact out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, which had 10,000 patients, of which 1,000 shuffled into this genetic testing arm. Now, the majority of these patients were prostate and uh, pancreatic cancer. But that being said, when uh, counselors went in and did a very careful family history and pedigree. Almost 10% of those who carried a germline mutation would not have been tested otherwise. So this is a big deal. We're finding stuff that you wouldn't otherwise predict you would find. Currently, the way we do it in clinic, there is an opt-in, meaning patients are told, hey, we're going to sequence your tumor, we're going to look for drug targets, but we might find stuff, cancer or otherwise, that have nothing to do with what we're going to do here, but may have implications for your family. Do you want to know? So they can say yes or no. Now, the question is, I, I've asked a lot of my colleagues, when should we do confirmatory testing? So you see a, maybe a BRCA mutation that looks worrisome. When should you confirm it? And the uh, variety or the diversity in answers is amazing. Some say we should confirm those who have suspicious findings. Others say never, that I'm not doing this test for germline. I'm going to tell the patient that, and we're not going to test them. I have one colleague who sends all of their patients with suspicious findings to a genetic counselor and says, you deal with this. We have another colleague, uh, based on a variety of past incidences that he encountered, who sends every test to his genetic counselors to kind of look over. I think, in my opinion, you should test or refer all patients who have a risk or if you see something suspicious. But that's my take on this. The bigger question, I think, though, is when and how do you counsel? Do you wait till they find you find something suspicious and then say, we found a problem, let's talk? Or should you beforehand say, we might find something, so just put that in the back of your mind and we might come back to it? Or do you do a whole full-blown genetic counselor routine of really telling the patient about implications? Another, I think, interesting aspect is the cost of testing. So this is one. I, you know, Milan and I can attest, we hear this a lot on the big stage. People will get up and say the cost of genomic testing is a huge problem, and we can immediately identify that that person's never really done this. If you get in the weeds with this, the good news is this is not a big problem from my perspective today. 
This was an interesting abstract presented at ASCO. I was actually the discussant for this session where a group out of Indianapolis looked at the cost to patients in the community setting. So this is a real world sort of situation. They found that on average to make a change in clinical management, the cost was about $3,700 to up to $9,000. Uh, this was considered their most relevant endpoint. Uh, maybe wasn't the best in terms of when we think health, Paul could do a much better job talking about prospective assessment of quality adjusted survival across the homogenous population. But this was the big one, the cost to the patient. So this is what patients paid out of pocket was somewhere between one and $200. So not cheap, but you know, in terms of medical bills, this is not a game changer here. So actually not a big deal. Now the problem with this is the reason it's so cheap right now is patient assistance programs. They are amazing. The companies that test love the data and they use that for drug development and so forth. As these tests become FDA approved, of which one, Foundation One, is now approved, this may actually change the dynamics. So this is still an evolving issue that I think we should uh, keep on the front burner. Finally, the other question that I think has been one that's both interesting and evolving for us is when do you test, okay? When we started this program, uh, we didn't want to be overly cavalier, and our recommendations were to test when there are no other options, or if the patient had a rare tumor for which there are no options. As we started looking at, a da at our data and others' data, we recognized that when you do it that late, the patients would get tested, there would be a four to six week turnaround, and many of the patients were either dying or ready to die before they ever got the results back, and the findings that we had were very modest. So, our question was if we move it up earlier, could we do a better job for our patients? And so uh, the University of Michigan uh, have not published their data, but they are suggesting that earlier, doing the earlier testing is probably more beneficial. These are data that Milan just pulled out a couple of days ago, so these are unpublished data. But a look at our own database. On the top, you can see for the patients in the frontline setting, um, Oh, thank you. The uh, red line represents the genomic guided, the, the blue and green lines represent the non-genomically guided therapy. So you can see in the early setting a highly significant difference in terms of outcome. And on the bottom graph, you can see if you test in the later line settings that that substantial benefit starts to melt away. So again, enforcing that if you're thinking about doing tumor genomic testing, you're probably better off doing it early. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to act on the results early, but it allows you time to prepare for getting patients to clinical trials in these drugs. So these were the kind of questions that we came up with, but I thought this would be a good start for a discussion around this topic. Okay. So because we're broadcasted, I do have to bring the microphone to you. Thank you for an excellent talk. So you mentioned the cost of the medication. Can you talk about uh, patients who have insurance that cover it as opposed to patients who might have to pay out of pocket for it? And does it change the cost of therapy that's offered? Yeah, so, and, and my apologies, a good question regarding uh, cost of the drug and, and cost of testing. So the, re the, the cost that I put up there was actually for cost of testing, and it wasn't related to cost of drug. But the, 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 that brings a very, very good question. What if you find a really cool drug and then you want to give it, uh, and then it's going to cost $100,000 for the patient because then it doesn't help. We have worked, uh, so first thing I would say is that we try to get all of our patients to clinical trials. That's always our primary goal because that is done in the context of the learning environment and patients should get free access to drugs. It is true, though, that we do off-label drug use, in which case the patient's at higher jeopardy for having to pay. We have a full-time staff that actually work with either patient assistance programs and insurances, and our rate of getting complete coverage for the drug is incredibly high. So it's not 100%, it's probably above 90% right 90%. now. Yeah. I'm getting a text um, here. Can um, patients self-refer, or is the oncologist referral required? Uh, we prefer the oncologist to refer. Oh, uh, yeah, we prefer the oncologist to refer, to refer, but the refer is really simple. We just need uh, the doctor or the nurse to send us a name, and we usually take it from there. Yeah, I have a, a general question. Who has access to the genomic data? Yeah, so the, as of now, uh, the only, 
right now it's just me uh, in a group in, in Dr. Schneider. Uh, we, we, we button down, we really keep it highly secure um, just to, because of the concerns of being able to, of, you know, that stuff leaking out and so on and so forth. So it's kept under pretty hard lock and key. Um, uh, right now, of the analysis we do, it's, it's always been done internally under IRB protocol. It's, a, it's a, a really important question, though, and the reason I say this is you think about genomic technology. Uh, as Milan mentioned, there are very few repetitions here, and we in the world of cancer love repetition. We love big phase three trials. We love 10,000 patient studies because that's how you make conclusive answers. And one of the criticisms has been of genomic technology is that a lot of people are doing it, but we're not collaborating. And so there have been major uh, national efforts and in some cases international efforts uh, to really start to accumulate experiences across the major centers that do this. And, you know, quite frankly, I think this is going to be the way we make major strides forward as you think about some of these rare mutations and drugs that may be blockbusters, but only for a small handful of patients. If we're not seeing these patterns across the United States or across the world, we'll probably miss them. And so I think strategically we're going to have to think about the best ways to do that. Um, so it's, it's going to be an important question. There was a really uh, neat paper that came out on Monday from the Broad Institute on genomic triangulation. I don't know if you heard about this, but essentially taking genomic data from public resources and then cross-referencing Ancestry.com and all these, actually identifying patients who are supposed to be de-identified on these public repositories. And so there's a lot of work right now that we need to figure out before we yeah. get yeah. too cavalier. All right, the next, uh, another text question. How should oncologists phrase or frame this idea to patients? Yeah, you know, so it's, it's a great question. I, the reason we have set up a uh, clinic for this setting is to try to facilitate that because these are not easy discussions. And to be frank, as Dr. Help mentioned, I also run a breast cancer clinic. It is very hard for me to double as a genomics guy my breast cancer clinic. I mean, we're talking about uh, the disease process. We're talking about prognosis. We're talking about drugs, side effects sexuality, re reproduction, uh, self-image, all kinds of things, and then to try to layer that on top of, by the way, now let me talk to you a little bit about the genome, becomes overwhelming. And so the neat thing about doing it separately is that we prepare patients, we give them information to read beforehand, many of them go to the website, and then we do an entire introduction on what is the value uh, in doing this. So that's how we've approached it. Other doctors do it differently. Some just say, hey, I'm going to do another test on you like a CBC, and I'll tell you the result when it comes back. But I have found, you know, I think very similar to germline genetic testing, that often that, that can result in disastrous outcomes when you do it that way. the incredible complexity of the information that's returned to you, but at the same time, uh, one, because you get this written report, which is, has suggestions on it, you have this illusion that all you need to do is order the test and then figure out, you know, from the paper on, on page one what drug to give. And I have noticed that um, uh, my, you know, my favorite group to pick on is the Cancer Treatment Centers of America, which is run by a for-profit company, and they advertise, every one of their advertisements says that they do this. What I worry more about, even than them, would be a person like me who, and I'm a halfway decent oncologist, I would sit in a room and read this paper and come up with my own conclusion, and I recognize that I can't do that. So what do we, what do, we do? Should we be putting the brakes on this as a, you all are doing this right, you know, with a large group of experts, including, you know, everything from clinical and genetic scientists to basic scientists, which is, I think, at this point, what you need to interpret the information. Sorry about the length of that question. Yeah, I'll start. I, uh, and then I'll let Milan uh, chime in. So last year at ASCO, I led a uh, uh, discussion in a clinical science symposium d devoted to this entire topic, which is an incredibly uncomfortable one because, you know, you can be very insulting. Uh, to say that, yes, we can do this, but, but uh, no, you cannot. But I, I think this is a real problem. You, ha you are a fantastic oncologist, and the, tr and the truth is that some are more challenged at these sort of uh, results. 
Milan and I just completed a five series uh, molecular tumor board with Neil Love, who does a lot of these with community doctors. And he was blown away, concerned about the use in the community and wondered what the solution was, whether it was a national tumor board um, or some other. Should all people be getting sent to major centers? I, I, number one, I don't think there's enough bandwidth for that right now, uh, but I do see this as a major problem. Yeah, I've also have uh, squarely laid the blame on the testing companies. In their effort to get the test out more and more, they basically say, hey, you can do this. Yeah. And our interpretation team internally at X company will actually help you interpret it. And when we know that many of these interpretations have been dead wrong, I actually sent two mistakes this morning at the Foundation of Medicine. And so, um, you know, I've told them that, but in their efforts to want to disseminate, that's what they've sold. Yeah. yeah. All right, here's a question from someone at Arnett. Um, do you ever get surprise info that may be unrelated to disease via testing? And how do you manage that? Can, can you say, say that again? Yeah. Sorry. Did you ever get surprising info that may be unrelated to the disease yeah. via testing? And how do you manage that? Yeah, this particularly comes up when we find germline findings, so mutations that patients are born with that are not cancer-related. Um, we've had a few interesting uh, 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 types of uh, predisposition diseases. Uh, how we handle it, we have phenomenal genetic counselors. We actually have our new genetic counselor joining us today. <laughs> there you go, Leanne Sout, who uh, we would then refer to them, and they'll walk through uh, the details of the disease, risk for family members, and so on. Yeah, you know, the challenge here, though, and, and this is an evolving area, believe it or not, uh, Germline testing is one of the hardest tests to get paid for by insurance. I, I struggle with this all the time. Even in my breast clinic where I had, I had the other day a 35-year-old and I, it got rejected. I, I, it meets every guideline. Uh, the NCCN guidelines are getting a little more sophisticated. So just recently it did say if you see a BRCA mutation in the tumor, regardless of family history, they now recommend formally doing germline testing. So that will help, but it doesn't answer all the questions. What about ATM, check to PAL B2, et cetera. So uh, I think we're still struggling with these, you know, incidental things and how to, how to handle I also feel I need to give a shout out to Cindy Hunter, who's been with our program. She's handled so many of these uh, difficult cases. Um, the other thing that we don't, you know, just more of an aside, uh, we get asked a lot, do we do ancestry analysis because we have all the DNA? We, we don't tell them if they're Polish or Irish or German or whatnot, <laughs> <laughs> just if, in case you were wondering. Uh, but I will say there was one interesting case. We had a patient who we found a germline finding. It was in a young man uh, with cancer. And his mom and dad both were genealogists, and they could trace their lineage back hundreds of years. And they knew for a fact they did not have a lick of cancer in their, in their family history. And all of a sudden, the, the son who had the cancer looks at the dad and goes, are you sure you're my dad? <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so, you know, so we stay away from those topics. <laughs> Hi, great, great talk. I've really enjoyed it tremendously. I wanted to actually um, sort of follow through on what you asked for, which was feedback on thoughts on, on both the alpha label use and the germline question. I'll stick to the germline question, just just interest of time. So you're, it's an opt-in approach, uh -huh. and I wondered, are these genes you're finding in the germline analysis, any of the ones with the ACMG yes. list on the ones that should be returned as an, an opt-out basis, right? So I just said, once you've got it, genetic counseling is so important to understand what to do with it. But this question beforehand, how do they even think about it? And how you offer that as an opt-in is an interesting question. I don't know if you've yeah. So yeah. So you bring up a very good point. So the ACMG, ACMG has a, a list of genes. I think it's now 59. It went from 56 to 59 that they deem to be actionable and appropriate, and that if you happen to be doing broad sequencing, they recommend you counsel the patient about it. They also recommend the ability of a patient to opt out. And and I apologize when we say we opt in. I, I kind of we give them yes no. Uh, so I don't know if that counts as opt in or opt out. We basically ask them. Well, yes. Yeah, We, 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 we ask them to answer the question. We sit with them for that. So. And 98%, 99% say yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I have another text question, trying to balance the in-room and texting. Um, here's a oh, chance for you to advertise for yourself. Well, where can we find information to provide to potential patients? Do you have brochures available? We have brochures. We have a website. Well, website. Tell us at the website address. IUHealth.org slash precision hyphen genomics hyphen program, I believe. I think if you Google <laughs> IU Health Precision Genomics, it'll be one of the top few links. In case you're not a savant. Uh, like <laughs> and, and by the way, if you look at the video, I've lost 30 pounds since the video. You'll, 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 you'll notice it. You can always get our, our video will be available soon, so you can refer people to our video. 
So Paul mentioned that you were both very bright. Could you just slow down a little bit and tell people what ACGM is? And I think you're all implying, what you're talking about is the informed consent process, the box. That, could you just slow down a minute and explain that for people? Yeah, so uh, I, uh, American College of Medical Genetics, so it is a body of people who think about genetics, have looked carefully at all of the potential predisposition genes. And from that big, big list of which there are probably a couple hundred maybe of genes that can cause, and some of them cause bad things that you can do nothing about except tell the person sorry. They have uh, pared it down to about 59 genes that they feel if you carry something here, whether it's cancer or some sort of cardiologic predisposition, that by intervening, meaning the physician knowing it, might be able to do something to either prevent or prevent a catastrophic event from it. So they have put together this list of genes, which they say, if you're going to do kind of random sequencing, which is something we hadn't done in the past, that these are the 59 that the patient should at least be able to hear about. Mm -hmm. Hi, that was absolutely wonderful. My, I have a two-part question, I think. And the first one is, I think in society today, when we talk about some of the very expensive cancer therapies, one of the questions comes, is it appropriate to have an outrageously expensive therapy that may extend a, a patient's life by a matter of weeks or months? And you referenced some data about a 30% improvement from the um, genome-driven therapy over standard of care. But if better than horrible is bad, is that, st is that worth being excited about? And two is, do you have a mechanism in place whereby when you perform this sequencing, if there is no genetic um, marker identified that a therapy exists for that you have support services in place to help acknowledge that an additional therapy isn't available for that patient. So let me start with the second question first. And that has actually been an area of recent consternation for us because you, know, you can imagine with volume and trying to get things moving, Often we are rushing and calling a patient and saying, sorry, no results, talk to you later, right? Because initially we brought everybody back, and that was a bad experience too. A patient would wait in the parking garage. If you ever wait here, it's horrible. You know, you park, you pay 30 bucks for that. You wait in the, uh, the waiting room for 40 minutes, and then you come in and hear, see, hear me say, sorry. So we decided, well, we'll save them the trip and we'll call them. And that's been very traumatic for some patients too. So I actually spend a ton of time up front now addressing it, saying there's a chance we will find nothing, in fact, a reasonable chance. That doesn't mean you don't have options. doesn't mean Dr. Health doesn't have good standard options. It also doesn't mean you can't get on clinical trials. It just means the testing that we did will not add to that buffet of options for you. That has been a game changer, at least according to our nurses, in terms of how. So I say, when you get that phone call, it is not to say you don't have options. But if you get that phone call and you still want to come back and hear it from me, we still invite you to come back. And so our nurses will come in and reinforce the exact same thing I just said, and that has really, I think, helped out in that, in that regard. Uh, the first question, I forgot it already. About going from the horrible. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah I, I mean, this is a, uh, this is a much uh, tougher question. The, the first thing, you know, I, I would say is that I think we all acknowledge that, you know, doing this sort of technology in the earlier setting is where it's going to have major, major, no one disagrees that if you improve cure rates, you've probably done something pretty important. I always hesitate to look at curves and average durations. You know, I, I think, actually, Dr. Health taught me this when I was a fellow. What you're really looking at is a percentage of people doing well at a given time point. And if you go from a 20% chance of doing well at a year to 40%, that, that, that's actually a reasonable Thing. And the reason we show the anaplastic thyroid cancer is to provide a little bit of substance to those averages in that, in addition to on the whole doing better, you have some patients who do exceptionally better. I mean, the mortality rate of anaplastic thyroid cancer is 100%, and it is horrible. This guy's now two years out doing well. So we have those where I think it is meaningful. You know, a couple of quick things, you know, to your first question, new drugs and biomarkers come out on a weekly basis. So the percentage of patients who have negative results over time is getting smaller and smaller just because we have a lot more options. Uh, but exactly to the other point, I agree with Brian, you can never tell ahead of time who's the exceptional responder. 
you can never tell ahead of time. And actually, one of the things that we got a IU Health Values grant for is to go back, look at our exceptional responders, and understand understand their biology, and figure out if we can identify those patients ahead of time who are going to really all have the biggest mm. you know bang for the buck. So I think I think we have time for one more question. I th hopefully this will be a yes or no. This is a, a texting question. Um, is genomics testing available for blood cancers? Oh, it's not easy. Talk on. <laughs> uh, uh, you want me to say uh, through our program formally now? No, uh, but that may change. Uh, we're, we're, we are working on that. Uh, some of our hematologists do send out uh, some testing, so that's going to be. But that's going to be doctor by doctor. Thank right. you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So much for not being ethicists. No, seriously. I have. I, I really do worry about that. This problem. You just order a thing and you.